Woo! I'm up, guys. Very much up. I think I drink too much coffee. But we're going to find out on this episode of The Breeze. My name is Dre Breezy, and on today's episode of The Breeze, we're going to be focusing on the great work of Polly Murray. Now, many of you have probably not heard of her, but she was an activist, a writer, a lawyer. She was a poet and also eventually became the country's first black woman to become an Episcopalian priest. Her legacy really, really is phenomenal. She might be one of the most interesting people we probably talk about on this show. But before we jump into her life and her legacy, I want to talk about kind of some things that are going on in like today. And I know we've all been paying attention to the news and I am going to talk about Jacob Blake. But before I want um, to talk about so a couple podcasts ago, I mentioned the three trans women that had been brutally, you know, attacked in Los Angeles. Their names were Eden Estrada, Jaslyn Boussinet, and Jocelyn Allen. I talked about the video, how they were just waiting for a taxi, and there's this group of just cisgendered people, this mob that's just attacking them, harassing them, bullying them, robbing them, and just, you know, physically, physically assaulting them. Black Twitter was on it after this video, and I was really excited because they had seen, or they actually had found two of the guys, two or three of the guys in the video. Police made arrests. I was excited. I was like, whoa, this the criminal justice system is working the way it should. Of course, that excitement was cut short when I watched a video on Eden's Instagram, Instagram page where she talks about the charges against the men the criminals that attacked her had been dismissed. Hayden, how you doing? I'm okay, just waiting for the news. Yeah, so that's why I'm calling, and I wish I had better news, and but I wanted to let you know um, the district attorney has decided to temporarily reject the case for further investigation, meaning that the individual that was arrested is going to be released today. Um, are you serious? Yeah. So, the only thing I can, only explanation I can give to you is what was given to me by the district attorney's office. And the, the DA that was assigned this case feels that he needs more time to review the evidence. Now, whether that's typical operating standard procedure, I don't, in my experience, not typically, but that's that's the way that they want to do it. Um, I don't agree with it, and I don't think that it's right, but that's why I wanted to call you and let you know you hear from me that everything that could have been done and has been done, we've done everything that we possibly could do. And unfortunately, in the way that our system is set up, the buck stops with the district attorney's office. They have the ultimate say-so on what goes from this point. So we conduct our investigation, we go out, we make arrests, and we put people in jail, and the district attorney's office is left with the responsibility of filing criminal charges through the court system and keeping people in jail. In this particular situation, they decided that they don't, they're don't. they not in any particular hurry to do anything and that this person is going to be released from custody today. So we have a situation where we have on video these guys committing this crime. The whole thing is on video. They're not wearing, these idiots aren't wearing masks. And they're clearly showing no remorse because they're hee-hee, cackling, ha-ha the whole time. And we have a criminal justice system that can see that and still say to this girl, that's not enough evidence. And I just have to ask myself, if that's not if if capturing a crime on film is not enough evidence, then what the fuck is? I mean, what more evidence can you get? But it's not about the evidence. It's about the way we value transgendered lives. And there's no amount of evidence you can find. Just like with Emmett Till. There was no amount of evidence Emmett Till could have found to have proven to that white jury that he was innocent. If you've already made up in your mind that somebody's life is not valued and a crime happens against that person's life, that crime does not have as much weight and value because you don't value that person's life. And we see this 
being played out in real time with these group of women. And if you don't see an issue with it, if, if, if it doesn't bother you, I really would ask that you, you really look inside yourself and ask why. In addition to the injustice with these three girls, we've all witnessed the Jacob Blake shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Jacob Blake is a 29-year-old African-American male. He's actually from my home state of North Carolina. He's from Winston-Salem. But he was, um, I think he was living in Illinois, and he was breaking up a fight. He saw a fight going on, and he broke it up, and I guess he called the cops. When the cops came, he decided his job there was done, and so he goes to his car, and for some reason, the cops mistook him for one of the suspects, or I guess they weren't really sure what was going on. So one of the cops decides that Jacob is somehow the aggressor in the situation. He takes out his gun and shoots Jacob seven times in the back. It's just another instance of what the fuck police. I mean, what the shit. It just makes no sense. In addition to, you know, Jacob being unarmed, having his back turned to the cop, Jacob's three children, all under the age of eight, were in the car, saw the whole thing. Jacob, fortunately, is stabilized. He's in the hospital, but his father says he is paralyzed from the waist down. It's it's hard to even process, like, another video of an unarmed black man being shot and truth be told i wasn't really able to process it because a couple days later we have 17 year old kyle rittenhouse who goes to kenosha as a counter protester he's let's let me just throw this out here he's a huge trump supporter goes to counter protests Oh, who's calling me? I don't know. It's probably spam. Anybody get a trillion spam calls a day? So he goes out to Kenosha to counter protest against, you know, all those Antifa terrorists. And in the scuffle, or I'm not going to even say in the scuffle, he goes out there to shoot people. He goes out there with his AR-15 and is walking around in the streets. I mean, open carry. Let's keep in mind that to open carry, you have to be at least legally, you have to be at least 18. So he's illegally open carrying. He's doing it in front of the cops. He's doing it in front of the protesters and no one bats an eye. Whenever the, ten, whenever the you know, the energy, I guess, between the protesters and the counter protesters gets heated, Kyle cracks under pressure. He's 17. So of course he does what, I don't even know what he thought he was about to do out there. He murders two people. He murders two people in plain view of the cops. The cops, for some reason, don't arrest him, don't realize that there's a problem, or maybe, incur- I don't know what they were doing, but they didn't arrest him. He actually goes back home to Illinois. We're in Wisconsin. He goes back home to Illinois. He's arrested in his home a couple days later. It's just it's just crazy to think, you know, I couldn't even watch the video of him walking around the streets with this gun knowing what eventually happens just because it's just crazy to think that the color of one's skin matters so much in the outcome of your life. We all remember Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old. He was a black kid who was playing in the park with a toy gun. There's a video of this cop sees Tamir Rice playing, I guess thinks he's some violent criminal that's about to murder everyone, rolls up to this 12-year-old kid and shoots him dead. Two seconds flat. And we have a parallel video of a 17-year-old, I mean, just walking for hours, hours and hours, hours, and brandishing an AR-15 at a protest, and the cops don't do, they do nothing absolutely nothing to stop him. It's just such a glaring double standard of the criminal justice system. Why is it that cops are so much more afraid of a black of a, a black person that doesn't even have a weapon versus a white person that has a, a weapon that can kill 
dozens of people in a very, very quick amount of time. It, it makes no sense to us. And you can't explain it because it doesn't make sense. It, because it's so fundamentally unfair. It just it's just so frustrating. And I'm sure we've we were all feeling this frustration. And you know, we're talking about defunding the police, and we got Joe Biden out here talking about, well, I don't really want to defund them. You know, it's just an expression. And for Joe Biden, fuck off. Like this isn't an expression. These guys are crazy, they're corrupt, and they all need to go. They all gotta go. Because at this point in time, they're enforcing terrorism. And it's it's so bizarre. So, yeah, I just want to connect everything. I want to keep keep this podcast focused on the issues that affect, you know, black, indigenous people of color and trans people and women. But I also want us to stay tuned or stay tuned into what's going on in the real world, because we can't be so focused on the past that, that we forget about the president. We can't be so focused on the future that we forget about the past either. So let's just let's just stay strong through this crazy week. Hopefully learning about Polly Murray might help. So uh, welcome to The Breeze and let's dive into the awesome, awesome life of Polly Murray. Very few people had the impact that Polly Murray had in the 20th century. A gender-bending queer activist, poet, lawyer, and priest, Murray brings new meaning to the phrase Renaissance man. The legal theory she wrote in college provided the legal framework for desegregating the country, and she also helped end gender discrimination in this country as well. She was a trans, socialist, intersectional badass, and we at The Breeze are here for it. Let's begin to unpack her story. For the duration of this podcast, I'm going to be using she, her pronouns to describe Polly Murray, although she did not identify as cisgendered. Anna Pauline Murray was born on November 20th, 1910 in Baltimore, Maryland. She was a granddaughter of a slave and great-granddaughter of a slave owner. Her mother died from a cerebral brain hemorrhage at the age of three, and her father was committed to a mental hospital when she was six. At age three, she moved with her grandparents and her aunt to Durham, North Carolina. And I have to admit, um, that's one of the reasons that first drew me to Polly Murray was that we grew up in the same hometown. She wrote in her memoir, Proud Shoes, having no parents of my own, I had in effect three mothers, each trying to impress upon me those traits of character expected of a Fitzgerald, stern devotion to duty, Capacity for hard work, industry and thrift, and above all, honor and courage in all things. She grew up on Cameron Street in Durham, frolicking behind Maplewood Cemetery, and she also spent a lot of time in New York City. At 12 years old, her father was brutally murdered by a racist psych ward employee. The last time Polly Murray saw her father, he actually was murdered in a, a violent way. The employee of the psych ward beat him to death with a baseball bat. Murray describes the last time she saw her father, and she says his head was barely, barely sewn together. It was just, it was cracked up. I mean, it, it was traumatic, and uh, she was 12 years old when she witnessed that. Murray struggled with her sexuality and gender dysphoria during adolescence, but she became aware of her queer sexuality early in life. In Polly Murray and Caroline Ware, 40 Years of Letters in Black and White, historian Anne Fearer Scott explains, In adolescence, Murray began to worry about her sexual nature. She later said that she was probably meant to be a man, but had by accident turned up in a woman's body. She began to keep clippings about various experiments with hormones as a way of changing sexual identity. In 1937, at the initiative of a friend, she had been admitted to Bellevue Hospital in New York, and during her stay there, she examined her worries about her sexual nature in writing and said that she hoped to move toward her masculine side. She continued for years to discuss the developing medical literature about hormones, thinking they might help her. She discussed the possibility of homosexuality with doctors. She knew that she was attracted to very feminine, often white women. And she knew that as well, she, you know, she wasn't physically attracted to men. 
This conflict would continue for the rest of her life. According to the NYC LGBT, based on her reading of the sex theorists of the day, principally Havelock Ellis, Polly Murray thought of herself as more male than female. She termed, or she used the term, pseudo-hermaphrodite. She began experimenting with names including Pete, Dude, and Paul before settling on Polly Um, And oftentimes, when she was younger, she would dress like a Boy Scout or a young sailor on hitchhiking trips with girlfriends. Murray graduated from Hillside High School in Durham, North Carolina, which coincidentally, when I was growing up, was a school I wanted to go to because they had the best marching band. She applied to Columbia University in New York City, but was denied because she was a woman. She settled for all girls for the All Girls Hunter College during the Depression, and there she became active in the labor movement as well as arts and the human rights movement. She became friends with Langston Hughes and attended seminars and lectures by W.E.B. Du Bois and Mary McLeod Bethune. She graduated from Hunter College, top of her class, in 1933. She officially shortened her name to Polly to present as more androgynous. She attempted to go to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but she was denied because of her race, even with a letter of recommendation from Franklin Roosevelt. So I'm sure we're noticing a pattern of her being rejected uh, due to things she cannot control. But if that, let me just repeat this again. Polly Murray was denied to UNC Chapel Hill because of her race, even with a letter of recommendation from the president. Like, if you're wondering how strong the forces of racism were, that's a great example. And for anybody that under that tries to discuss the illegitimacy of affirmative action, just think about Polly Murray's life and how she was the top of her class and qualified in everything she does, but is still denied. I mean, how many of us would get denied from a job in 2020 with the with a backup letter well not this president but former presidents once you have a letter of recommendation from the president you're set like that's that should get you anywhere you need to go but because racism was the law of the land it still denied her her rightful opportunity she went to the NAACP the NAACP refused to take up the case they said because she was a resident of New York it just didn't look like she was personally invested in actually go. It looked like, I guess they made it seem like she was just doing it as a stunt. But the one thing that came from that, that came from her denial was she began a relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, which continued on her entire life. In 1940, Polly Murray was arrested for disorderly conduct when she refused to sit in the back of the bus 15 years before Rosa Parks. Murray actually hated riding buses. She believed that the weight of injustice was much stronger in such a confined space. Um, throughout the civil rights movement, really, the busing system was like the front lines. I mean, obviously, we all know about Rosa Parks, but but countless resistance, civil rights resistance um, leaders and activists protested first on them buses. And it makes sense because in a bus, you know, you're in this confined space and you have these rules for these arbitrary strict rules as to how you can behave depending on your on your skin color. The problem with that is you're at the mercy of the oppressors even more so because what happens if you resist? You get kicked off the bus and then what? You got to figure out, you know, it's just like it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. So it was actually interesting reading about Polly Murray and hearing that she preferred and oftentimes to walk miles to wherever she had to go because she just was so disgusted with the the blatant racism in the busing system. In 1941, she organized a restaurant sit-in or she organized restaurant sit-downs, which eventually desegregated the nation's capital. Murray was an important figure in the quest to save Odell Waller who was a sharecropper accused and convicted of murdering his white landowner. Long story short, Odell Waller, he was uh, he owned land and his sharecropper essentially throughout his experience was exploiting and tricking 
Waller into not only giving up his land, but then becoming forced to work on his land that he was tricked out of as a sharecropper. And eventually Waller, you know, started to realize that he was being duped and confronts the sharecropper. The argument escalates and Waller ends up shooting the sharecropper and the sharecropper dies. In the case, Waller argues self-defense to no avail. He was sentenced to death from an all-white jury. During this time, Virginia had a poll tax, so African Americans and poor people were largely excluded from legal and political representation. Polly Murray worked with the Workers' Defense League and Eleanor Roosevelt to get his execution appealed or commuted. A couple of days before his scheduled execution, the president, Franklin Roosevelt, actually called the governor of Virginia to get his sentence commuted because it just didn't seem like it was a fair trial. They still killed this guy. Odell Waller was executed on July 2nd, 1942, after, you know, nationwide protests and after all these civil rights groups had stood up for him, the president, the first lady. And uh, once again, that, that, once, that just shows the power of racism. We have the president and the first lady standing up for justice and standing up for what's right. And you have the Virginia governor and the local community saying, no, nah, like we just want to be racist and we want to kill this guy. And they did it. Odell Waller's case was a strong motivation for Polly Murray to become a lawyer. And the exposure that she got from the case got the attention of a Thurgood Marshall, who was a rising NAACP lawyer. He encouraged Murray to apply to Howard, which was a historically black university, is a historically black university. At Howard, Murray formed the Congress of Racial Equality. She graduated from Howard Law in 1944. She was the only female in the law program, and through that experience, Murray coined the term Jane Crow to describe gender discrimination. I'm going to talk about intersection. I've brought up intersectionality in former podcasts, but when it comes to the the intellect the intellectual understanding of intersectionality, that can be completely credited to Polly Murray. She was denied to Harvard because of her gender. She applied to Harvard and she was denied. So she finished her postdoc at the UC Berkeley School of Law in 1945. Her published thesis, The Right to Equal Opportunity in Employment, was a groundbreaking piece of work. According to The New Yorker, in her final law school paper, Murray had formalized the idea she'd hatch in class on her first day, arguing that segregation violated the 13th and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution. Some years later, when her professor Spotswood Robinson joined with Thurgood Marshall and others to try and end Jim Crow, he remembered Murray's paper, fished it out of his files, and presented it to his colleagues, including Thurgood Marshall, the team that in 1954 successfully argued Brown versus Board of Education. As we all know, the ruling in that case officially and legally desegregated the country. So yes, you heard that right. Pauli Murray's law school thesis provided the legal framework for ending segregation in the United States. Afterward, she quickly became California's first black deputy attorney general. After graduating, Murray moved back to New York and opened a law practice at Six Maiden Lane in Manhattan, New York. The firm struggled solely because she was a woman and obviously because she was black. I think around this time I read that there was only a hundred black women lawyers in the country. And while many groups were willing to hire black lawyers and many groups were willing to hire women, not very many groups were willing to hire the combination of the two. But because of her activism and her work, Murray was named Woman of the Year by Mademoiselle Magazine in 1947. In 1951, she published State's Laws of Race and Color, which was made public in libraries, black colleges, and used heavily in the NAACP. This work was over 700 pages of data Murray collected and recorded. She collected and recorded every known law of segregation in every state. 
This piece of work was groundbreaking as it bared the full-grown hypocrisy and unconstitutionality of separate but equal laws. Attempting to harness her growing clout, Murray applied for a U.S. State Department position as a diplomat, but was denied because of the rising McCarthyism. So the issue with Polly Murray is when she was younger in Hunter College, and especially when she defended Odell Waller, she aligned herself with communists and uh, labor rights groups. And McCarthyism at the time heavily demonized communists and heavily demonized homosexuals. And guess who was both of those? So it made it very difficult for her to be taken uh, legitimately when she was essentially on this blacklist for her identity. Also, not to mention, this is another instance of Polly Murray having a letter of recommendation from the White House. Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a letter of recommendation to get her the State Department position, and she was still denied. I mean, I, it's just cra- it's just mind-boggling to think about a person that is obviously excels at her at her craft and excels in her field and is is more than qualified for these roles and positions that she's applying for and is denied solely off of her identity. Murray decides to create her own income stream. She retreats and spent 4 years writing her 1956 memoir Proud Shoes: The Story of an American Family. The memoir was a success, leading to her being hired at a prestigious law firm, Paul Weiss Rifkin Wharton and Garrison. There she met who would eventually become a longtime lover, Irene Renee Barlow. In 1960, she moved to Ghana for about 16 months to serve as a senior lecturer at the Ghana School of Law in Accra. She co-authored the book, The Constitution and Government of Ghana. She came back to America when she noticed that the actual civil rights movement was was picking up steam, and Murray was appointed to serve on the Civil and Political Rights Committee of John F. Kennedy's Commission on the Status of Women in 1961. Murray was very involved with the civil rights movement, but she rightly criticized the 1963 March on Washington for excluding women from leadership. As I was learning about her life and her activism, I uh, thought it was very interesting how the March on Washington was explicitly segregated by gender. This event, you know, a lot of us are familiar with Martin Luther King's speech, but uh, the March on Washington was an all-weekend event, and every single speaker in that event was a man. They met with JFK at the end of that weekend, and every person that met with JFK was a man. In fact, with many of the indoor events during that weekend, they segregated the audience by gender and made the women stand in the balcony. Murray earned her Docker of Juridical Science from Yale Law School in 1965. She was the first black woman to graduate with that honor. Murray worked on the National Board of Directors for the ACLU from 1965 to 1973. She was a founding member of the civil rights group National Organization for Women with Betty Friedan in 1966. Just like her activism with the civil rights movement, she apparently grew increasingly frustrated with now because she, Polly Murray, wanted an inclusive civil rights organization that fought for the rights of women, black people, minorities, and all of the people that are kind of being tread on by the government. And the National Organization for Women originally started off with that intention, but very quickly became a vehicle for middle-class white women to gain their rights. And she saw a problem with that because there was just a lack of intersectionality and black women were being left behind. Murray was co-counsel in the White v. Crook case, which eliminated sex and race discrimination in jury selection. 
She was listed as a co-author in Reed v. Reed, which ruled that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment prohibited differential treatment based on sex. This ruling, uh, this case was actually led by a young emerging lawyer. Her name was, was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She co-authors or she gives credit to Pauli Murray for the legal foundation through the thesis that she published in college, the Equal Opportunity Thesis. How, how powerful is that? I mean, this woman already in her lifetime has been influential in ending segregation in this country and ending gender discrimination. I mean, what a remarkable legacy. Murray taught at Benedict College in South Carolina and at Brandeis University from 1968 to 1973. Her partner and close friend Renee Barlow died in 1973, and that experience brought her much closer to religion and spirituality. She earned her Master of Divinity degree in 1976 from New York's General Theological Seminary, she was ordained a deacon on June 9th, 1976, and ordained a priest on January 8th, 1977, making her the first Black woman to ever be ordained as an Episcopalian priest. She performed the Holy Eucharist at the Chapel of the Cross in Chapel Hill a month later, and she was the first African-American woman to do so. As you can see, Polly Murray has broken through every barrier that was placed in front of her. Part of me really appreciates the pettiness of working. Okay, so the Chapel of the Cross in Chapel Hill is right beside UNC Chapel Hill's campus. And UNC Chapel Hill was a school that originally denied Murray because she was black. It's just so powerful that she says, it's just like a kind of big fuck you to UNC Chapel Hill. She's like, not only have I done everything and accomplished everything I wanted to in life, I'm now... My last accomplishment is going to be becoming an Episcopalian priest and working right beside your campus. It's just a special type of, of powerful, you know, just somebody that, that just always found her way around those obstacles. Murray spent the rest of her career traveling the East Coast giving sermons and lectures. She died in Pittsburgh in 1985 from pancreatic cancer. I just think it's so important to note that Polly Murray was the first prominent activist to champion the idea of intersectionality. She commonly felt frustrated at the lack of cooperation between genders and races in the arena of civil rights. She wrote, I hate to be fragmented into Negro at one time, woman at another, or worker at another. Murray constantly advocated for the inclusion of women in leadership roles in the civil rights movement and women of color in roles in the women's rights movements. Often her concerns were dismissed and denied. Murray was far ahead of her time in her calls for full inclusion and a desegregated human rights movement that focused on ending economic, racial, and gender-based discrimination. In 2009, the Polly Murray Project was founded in collaboration with Duke University to promote Murray's work and legacy. They posthumously released the book Jane Crow, The Life of Polly Murray in 2017, and her childhood home has been preserved as the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice. Murray was eventually granted sainthood by the church in 2018. As an avid writer, reader, poet, activist, feminist, lawyer, trans, lesbian, queer person, and civil rights hero, Polly Murray accomplished more in one lifetime than many of us could accomplish in dozens. Her commitment to organized labor and activist causes netted her lifelong friendships such as Langston Hughes, James Baldwin, and Eleanor Roosevelt. Despite discrimination on the basis of her race, gender orientation, and sex, Murray succeeded and used her intelligence to shift the trajectory of the American experiment. Her work has largely been erased due to respectability politics and the idea that we can't celebrate a trans woman, a trans, and especially a trans woman of color, but we have to do the work to insert her into the larger canon of civil rights heroes. Murray deserves every bit of praise. Her selfless work provided the foundation for so many legal arguments that have allowed our country to thrive and prosper. Murray is a legend without peers, and I challenge anyone that says otherwise. 
We'll be right back after a paid message from one of our sponsors. Hi, I'm Batman. I took a break from fighting crime in my fictional city of Gotham to pay attention to what's been going on in your country. Man, I thought it was bad over here with Joker and Poison Ivy, but you guys are all fucked up. Over here, Mr. Freeze is way past his prime. I started calling him Mr. Windchill. Huh. Huh. At this point in time, some of your politicians can't compete with our worst villain. They're even named like villains. Newt Gingrich just sounds sinister. And what's up with that Mitch McConnell guy? He seems like a real turd. I usually don't do this, but I was thinking about sending some of our lightweight Justice League members to help you guys out. Plastic Man and Zatanna seem really pumped to make a difference. I would take the job myself, but Robin's been bugging me about staying out fighting crime all night. He's been a bit needy after we made it Facebook official. I'm a billionaire, so I can pay for as much commercial as I want, but I think it's best to end now. Help will come before you bat an eye. Get it? Batman out. Thank you, Batman. I had originally intended to support a Black-owned business during a local Black-owned business during this segment, but I was browsing on Netflix yesterday and I happened upon a film that I really think you guys should watch. It's called Disclosure and it's directed by Sam Feeder, who is a transgendered man, and the film basically explores the relationship of transgendered men and women and cross-dressers in film. It talks about the beginning, which was in D.W. Griffith's 1914 film, Judith of Bethulia, and it takes us all the way into the present time with Pose. Pose was a show I talked about on Janet Mock's podcast a couple weeks ago. This, this movie was just so well put together in how it chronicles in many ways, how the media is so so much responsible for the reaction that the general public has regarding transgender people. The media really has informed how we react, how we, how we think, like the social stigma, all the taboos that are attached to transgender people and people that don't fit into a gender binary. And it really has, has treated us or has conditioned us to believe things about the transgender community that are, are patently false and ridiculous. What made this movie stand out so much is that they really do, it really comes from the voice of transgendered people. So it features Laverne Cox, Susan Stryker, Alexandra Billings, Jamie Clayton, Chaz Bono, Yance Ford, Trace Lissette, MJ Rodriguez, Angelica Ross, Candace Kane, Lily Wachowski, Michael Cohen, and so many more. And they all kind of explain their different reactions and their thoughts about, you know, even certain films that we're all familiar with, like Hilary Swank's Boys Don't Cry. And they, they talk about how Bugs Bunny, for a lot of them, was a, a positive representation of transgendered experience. Uh, for me, it, it just really illuminated so much about, once again, the diversity of the trans experience. Because when it comes to accepting trans people into our hearts, into our lives, the first step to doing that is knowing trans people and understanding that there's a range of personalities and emotions and beliefs and ideas that all trans people have. They're not a monolithic group. Caitlyn Jenner in no way is the same as Angelica Ross. They're completely different people because they had completely different backgrounds and experiences. And sometimes the media stereotypes transgender people. Let me scratch that. Sometimes the media stereotypes any minority in any group in order to fit a certain narrative that makes bigoted people or that makes closed minded people feel better about their bigotry. So go out there. It's on Netflix. Check it out. It's not a long movie at all, and it's so well edited that the, it never drags. The pacing just keeps boom. It's like boom, 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 boom. In a lot of ways, that's kind of what I did with this podcast, you guys. I'm usually, you, you know, I try to throw in a couple clips, try to throw in a little bit of, you know, background audio or whatever of, of the actual people that I'm discussing. I try to find clips of them speaking. But Polly Murray has done so much in her life that I knew if I threw in more, this podcast 
podcast would never end. And I know you guys have a life and I just want, you know, most of my podcasts to be between 30 and 45 minutes, you know, something to listen to in between time, in the meantime. So I didn't get too much into the nitpicking and the, the audio files and everything. I want you guys to go on with your lives. But check out Disclosure on Netflix. It was released in June, I think June 11th, 2020. So it hasn't been out for too long, but it's definitely something you want to watch if you want to get a better understanding of the history of transgendered representation in film. When you're living in this world, it's a struggle to survive. Jacob Blake's seven shots still opened up his eyes. Nothing easy unless your family never really had to work. In this country, being pale is a privilege and a perk. Society will tell you that your melanin is a hindrance. Don't let those bigots steal your joy. Take those words. Build a fence. Build a fence around your heart. Protect your peace. It's a start. Life ain't gonna give you lemons. Took me years to learn that part. so much for listening to this episode of the breeze podcast if you want to learn more information about Polly murray go to my website at www.findthebreeze.com there you can also find information about anyone i've had on my podcast as well as accompanying articles and if you want to help or be an ally to the lgbtq community you can find resources there don't forget to like subscribe and follow me on apple and spotify and you all enjoy the rest of your weekend and i'll see you next week where we talk about the controversial chelsea manning